So uh, without further ado, let's get into it. Uh, the main topic for today uh, started being the path for crypto post US crackdown. Uh, that seemed to be the case um, the past few months, but they sort of have taken a, a U-turn um, in the past few weeks. So we'll talk about you know just what has happened um, so that we're all up to speed. And I know there's some confusion in exactly what the, the recent actions have been and, and their repercussions. We'll analyze the market impact, showing some very interesting charts on the effects that uh, all of this regulatory crackdown um, and actions have had uh, on Bitcoin and the rest of the crypto market, looking at on-chain metrics, dominance, a few other great insights, um, and what are the potential implications for crypto in the US as well as globally, and some opportunities that can arise off of that. Um, so before getting started, quick update about what we're building here at Into the Block. Uh, so as you guys know, we have the core analytics product. Uh, we have some licenses that we've launched for those in the past few weeks. We launched with BitOasis, which is one of the largest uh, crypto exchanges in the Middle East. Uh, you can now access into the block analytics through the BitOasis platform. Similarly, we partnered with SwiftX, uh, which is one of the largest uh, crypto exchanges in Australia. So our analytics are growing uh, through these regional exchanges. Uh, and also we're growing uh, our partnerships with DeFi, uh, where we've been devoting a lot of our time. So uh, we're launching, this is yet to be announced, uh, but in the next few weeks, we'll be launching the Curve Risk Radar, um, which is our new risk product that is free to access for anyone um, in the, you know, anyone at all, not, not even need to register. Uh, it's what we call a, a risk radar. So we have a very in-depth indicators, both on the curve tax protocol in general, and more specifically on some of the pools, uh, which are very pertinent indicators for anyone that's looking to provide liquidity or trade maybe a more niche uh, stable coin. Okay, now on to the main topic. Let's dive into understanding the crypto crackdown in the US. So um, before 2023, we had been seeing tensions build up uh, with the uh, SEC already being uh, increasingly aggressive against crypto, particularly since Gary Gensler took over. They started off by suing uh, some of the smaller players in the crypto industry, like Ether Delta or Bitrex, you know, some uh, relatively smaller exchanges. Um, and they've sort of grown, like used those successes against smaller exchanges that didn't have that many resources to fight against the SEC. Uh, and they're using that in their advantage to go after bigger and bigger targets. That's sort of been the, the playbook for the SEC uh, and it's continued to build up. And in March, 2023, uh, we get a few items that, uh, you know, uh, kind of hint at something greater coming. Um, feel free to check out Floyd's uh, bot taking me uh, meeting notes, apparently. No, not, a, uh, not, a, not advising that it's uh, official or anything, but um, just as a side comment. And now back on, onto the main subject. Um, in March 2023, we were seeing these um, hints from the SEC that something greater will come. <clears throat> so one thing that was happening in parallel was that Grayscale was suing the SEC for not letting them turn the GBTC product into an ETF. And so they had in, in March the lawsuit hearing with the courts, uh, which came out relatively favorably for, for Grayscale. Um, at least that's what major reports from, from lawyers there are, are uh, alluding to. Uh, at the same time, uh, Coinbase uh, received a Wells notice a few days later, which essentially is like the, a notice that you will be receiving some type of action um, uh, and for breaking the law, allegedly, uh, which we saw later. And uh, the SEC also issued towards the end of the month an investor alert against crypto securities, uh, which in retrospect seems like a very clear warning of what they ended up executing 
And so in early June, uh, we see the, the fight uh, against the biggest players in crypto really uh, rise up. And so they first go after Binance, um, both Binance US and Binance International, but mostly Binance US, um, which is, you know, a uh, subset of the parent company in Binance. And they're going after them for three main reasons. Uh, number one, for trading unregistered securities and them not being re registered as a securities exchange. However, you, you do see the same pushback from both Binance and, and Coinbase that they, they are just recently saying which assets they consider to be securities. Assets like uh, Solana, Cardano, Matic, and a few smaller uh, tokens. Um, but they're not even saying exactly why they consider those to be security, nor are they providing a path for these tokens to register our securities. Um, so that's that's the main argument, regardless that they're fighting against Binance um, and Coinbase, the one that they have in common at least. And then they're also going after Binance for uh, alleged, allegedly harder uh, reasons um, for breaking the law, doing things like fund management uh, that was misleading. So um, Binance has claimed that they uh, have separate accounts for each users, but um, the SEC claims that they have been in, in fact commingling user funds, not just within them, but also with Binance internal company funds. So that could be a very big uh, liability and a, a big reason uh, against Binance. The, then the, they are also suing them for having U.S. users register into Binance International without uh, proper prevention. Uh, and to put things as a cherry on top, they came out with this tweet where the chief compliance officer from Binance uh, admitted that they're trading uh, uh, a securities, operating a securities exchange in the USA, uh, which, of course, uh, doesn't look good for their case. Then uh, just a day later, in June 6, they come after Coinbase um, for also for the main argument of trading on registered securities, many of which were also in the Binance case, despite the lack of clarity uh, that they have. But uh, on the more positive side, there is no allegations on fund mismanagement or KYC infringements like the ones that Binance had. So that's the main difference and something that's worth clarifying on how these two cases are different against each company. And we see here uh, the performance of, of Coinbase over the last month really took a massive hit um, against uh, about 10, 20%, I believe 20% as soon as that lawsuit drops. Uh, but over the past few days, we've seen that rise up significantly um, as we get some hints that there might actually be some positivity coming out of the regulatory situation, which I'll get into. Uh, and part of this comes as BlackRock enters the crypto space. So they have already been doing some smaller things within crypto. BlackRock, of course, being the largest asset manager in the world. Uh, they had invested, for instance, in Circle and managed part of the USDC funds. <clears throat> but then they take an even bigger step uh, for BlackRock itself, uh, within crypto filing for the Bitcoin spot ETF on June 15. It took a bit of time for the markets to react, but that was already uh, two weeks ago. <clears throat> this BlackRock Bitcoin ETF is different from different ETFs in that it would be uh, getting you know direct exposure to spot Bitcoin rather than the derivatives. And it will be custodied on Coinbase, which is kind of uh, you know, ironic given the SEC suing Coinbase in parallel, and it'll have advanced market surveillance, um, which is something that the SEC claimed that other Bitcoin ETF applications they haven't had. Uh, and BlackRock, you know, reason behind the optimism in markets is that they have a spectacular 98.8% record of approval in all of the 576 ETFs that they've uh, applied to. <clears throat> And this has started to create questions on whether, you know, the situation against uh, Coinbase and Binance was like the worst part of the regulatory crackdown. And if we're starting to see, you know, a 180 turn or at least conditions improve uh, within crypto and in the, with, in the U.S., it, it also raises questions of, you know, why exactly is BlackRock doing this now? 
uh, do they know something that we don't? So one major thing that has been pointed out uh, but by some ETF analysts, in, in this case, Eric Valtunas from Bloomberg, is that the grayscale decision from the lawsuit that I mentioned before is likely to get a, a decision uh, within the next few months. And it's increasingly uh, clear for analysts that they have a good chance that the, they'll win that case against the SEC and be able to convert the GBTC into a Bitcoin ETF as they have been wanting to for years. Uh, and, this, <clears throat> and this creates the SEC some discomfort seemingly, uh, allegedly rather, from, from this point of view, where they could feasibly want uh, someone that's more, you know, from the TradFi space to be operating uh, such a large product given the demand. Um, so given BlackRock's deep integration within uh, traditional finance and politics, there's at least some speculation uh, that BlackRock seems to believe that the uh, Grayscale case may plead in their favor, uh, which opens up the doors for an ETF, making this a perfect timing for uh, BlackRock to enter the space, giving there also uh, deeper integrations and, and more uh, greater reputation. Uh, and so just within a few weeks, we see sentiment in crypto switch very dramatically from, you know, everything being over to traditional finance institutions entering the space uh, at a massive speed. And I, there's also some confusion there. It's not exactly like they're just now deciding to enter the space. So for instance, um, the news of the exchange EDX also came up soon after the BlackRock ETF, and this is an exchange backed by Citadel, Fidelity, Charles Schwab, uh, amongst others. Um, and they launched on June 20. Uh, but however, they had been it had been announced that they would launch. It was already in the works in September. So it's not like they're doing it just now. Maybe the launch uh, was uh, in a similar timeline. And they're uh, interestingly listing all only assets that are not considered securities within the recent ETF filing from uh, from the SEC against Coinbase and Binance. So I don't, I don't think that's uh, too much of a coincidence. And they're also restructuring the exchange differently from how other from how crypto exchanges operate. And they operate more like a traditional finance uh, exchange where they have a separation within the clearinghouse, settling the trades, the custodians holding the assets, which uh, apparently are going to be through Anchorage, and also the platform itself, which is, you know, uh, operated separate, in a separate entity. And shortly after this and the BlackRock ETF, like around, along the same timeline, we see right after... Wisdom Tree and Vesco, Van Eck, Bitwise file for more Bitcoin spot ETFs, uh, which, you know, being a large effort to get these documents kind of implies that they had been working on these in parallel. <clears throat> and uh, we also see news that Fidelity is pre preparing to submit a spot Bitcoin ETF themselves as well, uh, which is, you know, big news with Fidelity being the second or third largest asset manager behind BlackRock. Um, and all of this timing, of course, creates some appetite for conspiracy theories where, you know, the SEC is going after uh, crypto companies in the US, like native crypto companies, while traditional finance is slipping in, uh, getting after that opportunity, potentially opening up uh, that for them. And it's creating, you know, a bit of confusion and there's definitely some odd timing uh, there. But you know, we're not here to talk about conspiracies. So instead, we'll proceed with um, the market impact that this crypto crackdown and U-turn seemingly having in the in the markets. So uh, first off, it's becoming clear uh, that Bitcoin is benefiting from the whole situation uh, that has been going on in, in the U.S., uh, main reason is that Gary Gensler has been quite uh, vocal about saying that Bitcoin is the only one that's not a security quite confidently. Uh, and so that has created room for BlackRock and other institutions to embrace Bitcoin as a digital commodity of sorts. Uh, and so we see the dominance in Bitcoin in the market uh, reach a two-year high 
And we also see this like be replicating a similar pattern to what we saw in 2019, uh, where you know demand flew back into Bitcoin before it expanded towards the rest of the market, which potentially some people have claimed to be like a signs of early bull market. Uh, and to the flip side, we see some of the assets that the SEC um, claimed that are securities completely crashing. Uh, many of them revisiting the 2022 lows, while you know Bitcoin is still about twice as high from that price. So uh, this is, for instance, a chart of the Matic um, market cap versus Bitcoin market cap. It's dropped about 30% um, over the past few months after peaking in, in February. Uh, and you can see accelerated quite sharply um, in June, early June, after the SEC situation. Uh, also, this coincided with uh, Robinhood and uh, Celsius delisting, uh, well, selling some of these the securities. And in the case of Robinhood, it's delisting. And in the case of Celsius, just straight out selling them because they're securities. Um, and so that's ad adding extra pressure uh, to Matic and all of the other securities, uh, allegedly securities that the SEC now has come forth um, in that case. So we're seeing, you know, a very stark contrast uh, between Bitcoin and uh, the rest of the smaller assets with, you know, ETH and some of the other uh, non-security crypto assets kind of in between. Uh, we've also seen crypto decorrelate significantly uh, as, you know, these um, situations related to market specifically have affected crypto very differently from stocks. So we can observe here that the correlation versus uh, NASDAQ and S&P uh, is pretty much non-existent at this moment. It had been quite high after the, um, the SVB, Silicon Valley Bank, crack um, collapse. So we, had, we see here that correlation was nearly at one, implying a very high correlation. Then it dropped to negative as the crypto um, was sort of uh, lagging behind stocks as AI uh, you know, a hype took over for, for the NASDAQ. And now we see the correlation being back to near zero, um, which as I've been arguing at least personally that it seems like we're now in a new paradigm where crypto is again more of an uncorrelated asset and less like in 2022 where it was just a high beta uh, asset replicating the movements from stocks but at a higher volatility levels. And we see also, interestingly, the correlations with uh, gold and other precious metals hit yearly lows uh, recently, becoming quite negative. Uh, and this could be, um, you know, of course, Bitcoin has rallied significantly in this case with Bitcoin, not, not the rest of the market, uh, rallying significantly after the, the BlackRock news, while gold and other precious metals are struggling a bit more as the dollar has started to, to move forward a bit and it seems like interest rates are uh, going back up uh, next month. And so uh, talking about gold, uh, we see the, the other side of the coin um, from the US crackdown. As I mentioned, the crackdown is mostly against some of these uh, uh, smaller crypto assets that the SEC has been labeling as securities and also the crypto companies themselves but it never has been anything to do with Bitcoin itself. Uh, and so we see, you know, perfect timing the BlackRock ETF dropping. Uh, and we see a uh, parallel to how gold uh, ETF uh, was first launched uh, in 2003. And of course, there's a lot of optimism with uh, the price performance that gold um, had uh, increasing substantially in the years following that ETF approval. Um, so unsurprisingly, um, shortly after that Bitcoin ETF, we see the transactions from whales and institutions hit uh, yearly highs. So we can see this on chain by checking the number of uh, transactions with over a million dollars on Bitcoin, reaching a, a yearly high. Uh, and similarly, we saw uh, the large holders net flow indicator from Interblock show that the amount of Bitcoin entering these whales addresses uh, also reach a yearly high um, shortly after the BlackRock ETF announcement, you know, potentially signaling some bullish uh, accumulation. And now finally, 
uh, let's talk about the implications and opportunities that can come off from all of this uh, situation within uh, Bitcoin and the, in the US. So number one, I've uh, been alluding to this, uh, but it seems like institutions uh, are finally coming to uh, crypto, which you know has been um, kind of a meme within crypto since as early as 2017. Uh, but you know it gets realer and realer every time. And now with the ability to uh, potentially buy Bitcoin through an ETF, uh, which seems somewhat likely that that will happen soon, uh, we'll, we will have a much deeper integration between Bitcoin and the rest of the traditional finance system. Uh, and of course, this is important uh, because uh, the U.S. has the largest capital markets, so it facilitates inflows from you know the largest asset managers in the world, pensions, uh, retirement funds, uh, some of the BlackRock clients uh, into Bitcoin. So this creates um, you know uh, a new it opens a new market or a new segment of market players rather into Bitcoin, uh, which is why it can potentially be quite big uh, and how Bitcoin is actually benefiting from this crackdown uh, with other players versus the clarity that it has. So that's the, the first thing. Uh, then secondly, um, you know, after doing some research, I expect that this to be a, a roller coaster ride for these crypto securities. So for the smaller crypto assets that the SEC has already labeled as securities, as well as others that they haven't specifically labeled as securities, but are similar to the ones that they did, there right now it's very much uh, uncertain time for those. Uh, we saw, as I mentioned, Robinhood delisting them. Uh, Coinbase and Binance US are getting sued. Uh, for having those assets. So if they don't withdraw, if they don't remove those assets, uh, I believe they have a, a 28 days uh, to do so. Um, then some some states within the US will actually um, have some uh, additional moves against Coinbase and Binance, uh, potentially not allowing users to use their platforms within those states. So it's probably we'll see more delisting of these assets. Uh, and less appetite to launch other crypto securities or other crypto assets that may be considered securities uh, within the states. However, since the both Binance and Coinbase are fighting back against them, against the SEC, um, there's actually an argument to be made that medium term, the odds of the SEC finally providing a framework that specified you know, how decentralized you have to be to be considered a security how many uh, can it can you have a central company at all, or does it have to be fully decentralized? You know, it, clearly it's a spectrum, but we should be getting more clarity uh, on you know what made the SEC back in 2018 consider Ethereum uh, a commodity and not a security, and how if any there's a path for for some of these crypto assets to not be labeled a security. So that's the. The good news that we have higher odds of that clarity being provided uh, sooner than we would have otherwise. Uh, and longer term, even if they're considered securities, some assets or not, it's becoming increasingly likely that we'll have, again, a coexistence uh, between uh, this crypto securities and crypto commodities. Eventually, you might have, you know, Uniswap trading um, some of security tokens on a specific chain. That's you know whitelisted by some of the largest tradfi institutions, and in another chain, you know being just a regular open market that we're used to. Uh, but it's becoming likely that we we have we're going to have a path where there's coexistence between the two, and you know probably some whitelisted local U.S. version, and there's another um, global version. But overall, there'll be access both between tradfi and crypto longer term, uh, which is arguably uh, positive for the industry. Uh, and coming back to the opportunities from that near term, you know, while we wait for the US to provide all of this clarity, it seems like the it's a, an opportunity for the rest of the world to act quickly. And we have already started to see this. Um, so this is a newspaper on, on Japan, but uh, more specifically, we're seeing uh, Hong Kong move fast and start opening up crypto trading 
uh, back again and providing some clarity on which assets uh, are they think are securities and not and the reasons behind them more importantly so we're seeing companies open back up there we're also seeing uh, the regulators support uh, banking institutions backing these crypto companies uh, from what I've uh, researched so it seems like while in the U.S. we're seeing the choke point 2.0 where less crypto companies are getting financial access in Asia uh, it's becoming a lot easier to operate. So we're definitely seeing in that sense, crypto companies and protocols moving offshore. Um, and at the same time, they are moving on chain. So um, whereas users before, you know, in 2017, used mostly Coinbase in the US, uh, now Uniswap and the rest of DeFi are providing a proper alternative. So uh, we have been, mentioning this trend uh, since the FTX days that it's very likely that DeFi is the path forward. And, you know, back then the percentage that DEX, the market share that they had out of all volume was quite low, um, you know, still spiking. Uh, but I'm not surprised that we saw this uh, spike early in the year in May, hitting a new all-time high for DEX share. And, and I think uh, this trend is likely to continue moving upwards even further as uh, you know there's some constraints not allowing users to access tokens for coinbase that creates an opening for universally accessible uh, dexes uh, like uh, not just dexes but uh, financial services um, so that's that's going to be a, a great momentum boost for for DeFi over the long term uh, and also at the same time we're seeing greater usability and education for players, for users to access these services. So to conclude, <clears throat> we're seeing the US put significant pressure on American crypto companies and protocols. Bitcoin uh, currently is the main benefactor from this since it's the asset with the most regulatory clarity uh, and uh, non surprisingly, it has led to institutions embracing crypto, uh, embracing Bitcoin specifically as uh, the main asset behind crypto. Um, and that's likely to continue within the US for the next few months at least. And for the rest of crypto, what uh, that creates is you know the, the transition for crypto to move offshore, as I mentioned, mostly into Asia and on chain into DeFi services. Um, and I do expect that there will be some short-term difficulties in this transition. Uh, as with any major scale transition that we're uh, that the industry has gone through, um, but you know there's some optimism that crypto securities will get more clarity sooner than we would have otherwise, and eventually be able to be traded back in the U.S. as there's more clarity provided by uh, regulators. So that's it for today, guys. Uh, thanks everyone for tuning in. Um, make sure to sign up for our next webinar. Here we'll be talking uh, less about the market and more specifically about one of our key research areas, which is the risks in DeFi. Um, we'll be talking about our general processes, how we model risks and how you can monitor these. As I mentioned, we see DeFi as a major wave driving crypto forward um, and risks are quite high there still. So it's it's definitely some an area that we have put you know a, a large time of our focus. Uh, and our CEO will be taking this one. So make sure to sign up. Uh, our team just shared the, the link for you to sign up. Um, and I'll also be sticking around for, for some questions 